This lesson covers reproductive racism and women's freedom. When I speak of reproductive racism, I am referring to the experience of black women and the treatment of their bodies as objects for someone else's profit, pleasure, or and against her interests. The enslaved woman's experience demonstrates how racism facilitated behaviors injurious to the woman and to the entire community because it facilitated other grave evils of rape and adultery and vice flourished. In Harriet Jacobs' Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, she tells of how her grandmother breastfed her mother and her mother's mistress. The grandmother weaned her mother at only three months old so the slave owner's child could have better nourishment. At the earliest age, the infant mother bond is subordinate to the will of the slave owner. At the age of 15, she describes how her master, 40 years her senior, began his assaults of her. She gives a clear assessment of the terrible predicament of the enslaved girl and of the debased soul of men unfettered by law, reason, or morals. She says, he was daily violating the most sacred commandments of nature. He told me I was his property, that I must be subject to his will in all things. My soul revolted against the mean tyranny. But where could I turn for protection? No matter the slave girl be black as ebony or as fair as her mistress, in either case, there is no shadow of law to protect her from insult, from violence, or even from death. All these are inflicted by fiends who bear the shape of men. Enabled by the enslaved state of the girl, the man disregarded his marriage vows. What evil did he introduce into his own marital relationship? Where was his self-mastery? Lust and power ruled him and he acted with no shame. What of his wife? Jacobs tells of how the wife commanded her to tell the truth of her husband's activity, which she did. Instead of sympathy and protection, her mistress felt that her marriage vows were desecrated, her dignity insulted, but she had no compassion for the poor victim of her husband's perfidy. She pitied herself as a martyr, but she was incapable of feeling for the condition of shame and misery in which her unfortunate helpless slave was placed. Jacobs assesses the damage. To what disappointments are they destined? The young wife soon learns that the husband in whose hands she had placed her happiness pays no regard to his marriage vows. Children of every shade of complexion play with her own fair babies. And too well, she knows that they are born unto him of his own household. Jealousy and hatred enter the flowery home and it is ravaged of its loveliness. Black people's, especially black women's bodies, were also subject to medical experimentation. These experiments and treatments were done for the benefit of the slave owner, or more to the point, almost never for the benefit of the enslaved. If there were concern for restoring her body, it was only so she could be profitable whether that meant working in the field or bearing more children. Both added to the slave owner's wealth. These women were just specimens. Harriet A. Washington's groundbreaking book, Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present, details the many ways black people's bodies were abused and used medically for the benefit of white society. Of particular note is the account of Dr. J. Marion Sims, the so-called father of gynecology. Sims performed surgeries on enslaved women without anesthesia. He claimed black women did not feel pain like white women and therefore did not need anesthesia. But his notes revealed the extreme suffering of the enslaved women. His white male doctors who would physically hold these women down 
while Sims performed painful unmedicated vaginal surgeries, quit assisting him because they could no longer bear the screams and cries of the enslaved women. Childbirth for the usually malnourished enslaved women had many complications, one of which was their small pelvises due to vitamin D deficiency. The small pelvis made birth difficult, especially among very young enslaved women. Sims attempted surgeries to repair the injuries suffered as a consequence of these deliveries. He operated on one poor young enslaved girl over 30 times. Her name was Anarka, and she was 17 at the time of her first unmedicated operation. He had access to 11 enslaved women and freely operated and experimented on their bodies to perfect his surgery. Besides the terrible pain, his enslaved patients suffered indignities not permitted with white women. White female patients were fully dressed and doctors would examine them under copious layers of clothing, all the while averting their eyes. Conversely, Sims made his enslaved patients strip completely naked in full view of all the white male doctors. His enslaved female patients had no real say over their treatment or any of the things Sims decided to do to their bodies. They were slaves and their consent was not needed. These women bore all the risks and pain of his experiments, while white women received all the benefits of any surgery that Sims perfected. He also used anesthesia on his white female patients, so they did not suffer the pain the enslaved women did. While he has been lauded as the father of gynecology, we must recall how chattel slavery and the suffering of black women undergird his so-called achievement. Incidentally, the city of New York removed a prominent statue of Sims in 2018 from Central Park in the Harlem part of New York, which is predominantly black. While Sims was one of the worst, he was by no means the only medical figure who committed such atrocities on black people. It is important to note that this legacy of medical abuse and malpractice informs aspects of modern healthcare of African Americans today. While there were many kooky, racist theories about the inferiority of black people, eugenics became a popular belief that fueled efforts to sterilize the so-called unfit. Eugenics was used to explain how the innate inferiority of non-white races contributed to crime and poverty in the United States. Simply put, you were either well-born, possessing good, healthy, beautiful traits, read that to mean healthy, educated, wealthy white people, or you were born into so-called weaker races and labeled as misfits, deviants, degenerates, and criminals who should not and later on must not procreate given their genetic inferiority. It was not uncommon in the 20th century for eugenicists to conflate race and class with biology. One may wish to read The Mismeasure of Man by Stephen Jay Gould. It is an important critique showing how eugenicists practice pseudoscience based on their racial prejudices about other races and ethnicities. Eugenicists would also advocate for public policies promoting so-called racial hygiene. These policies encouraged or discouraged reproduction among various populations depending upon their respective genetic profiles in order to reduce and eventually eliminate social ills in our society. It did not take long for laws to be passed to mandate forced sterilizations. In 1907, Indiana was the first state to successfully pass a law mandating sterilizations for mentally disabled people. Soon after, a campaign to pass a federal law in this regard failed. Many states passed the same kind of sterilization laws across much of the country. Roughly tens of thousands of people, mostly women, many of color, were forcibly sterilized. David Zucchino notes, between 1929 and 1974, nearly 7,600 people were sterilized under orders from North Carolina's Eugenics Board. 
Nearly 85% were women or girls, some as young as 10. The United States Supreme Court overwhelmingly affirmed these state laws in its 8-to-1 landmark decision in Buck v. Bell of 1929. The court affirmed that mandating the sterilization of the mentally disabled did not violate the United States Constitution. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. wrote for the majority, It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Interestingly, Oregon was the last state to perform a legal forced sterilization in 1981. Harriet A. Washington's medical apartheid states, African Americans were roundly disparaged by eugenic theory as scientists continued to seek and find wide physiologic evidence of black inferiority. Eugenics was appropriated to label black women as sexually indiscriminate and as bad mothers who were constrained by biology to give birth to defective children. The demonization of black parents, particularly mothers, as medically and behaviorally unfit has a long history. But 20th century eugenicists provided the necessary biological underpinnings to scientifically validate these beliefs. Thus, eugenics undergirded medical social movements that placed the sexual behavior and reproduction of blacks under strict scrutiny and disproportionately forced them into sterility, both temporary and permanent. For example, Margaret Sanger, founder of the American Birth Control League, which later was renamed Planned Parenthood Federation of America, initially promoted contraception to limit reproduction among the African-American population. She was a prolific writer, speaker, and activist. She stated her aims in the New York Times in 1923. The gradual suppression, elimination, and eventual extinction of defective stocks, those human weeds which threatened the blooming of the finest flowers of American civilization. She opened a string of healthcare clinics offering instruction and access to contraception under the guise of responsible family planning in poor African American communities. This practice became the business template for ongoing expansion. She cleverly launched a Negro project to recruit so-called Negro leaders to help promote contraception to their respective communities. She wrote in a letter to her colleague, Dr. Gamble, we do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And therefore the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. Despite a century of denials, Black employees at the Planned Parenthood of Greater New York spoke the plain truth in a letter in 2020, writing, Planned Parenthood was founded by a racist white woman. As a result, Planned Parenthood removed her name from their Manhattan Health Center in New York City. Yet its so-called core services continue to be contraception and abortion, both of which, some say, have a genocidal effect on the African-American population. For another example of reproductive racism, we need look no further than pro-life advocate and civil rights activist Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer is an icon who embodies the struggle for human life and dignity, as well as freedom and equality in our society. Hamer, like many women of her generation, was the granddaughter of a slave. She was the youngest of 20 children, and her parents were sharecroppers. She lived a grueling life amidst crushing racism and poverty in Mississippi. For instance, by the age of 13, she picked 200 to 300 pounds of cotton each day, all while living with polio. She worked basically on a modern plantation. Hamer became a community organizer, a voting rights activist, and a woman's advocate 
suffering multiple attempts on her life from beatings to drive-by shootings. She later gained prominence as a co-founder and vice chair of the Mississippi Democratic Freedom Party, which challenged the Democratic Party during the Mississippi Freedom Summer. The Mississippi Democratic Freedom Party challenged the all-white Democratic Party in Mississippi for excluding and discriminating against non-whites during the state's electoral process. To that end, Hamer and the Mississippi Democratic Freedom Party officials traveled to the 1964 Democratic Convention held in Atlantic City, New Jersey, to stand as the official delegation from the state of Mississippi. Although her group was denied, it exposed the racism of many Southern Democrats who worked to deny voting rights and representation of their fellow citizens. A lesser known fact, however, about Fannie Lou Hamer was that in 1961, she was sterilized during surgery without her knowledge or consent or for any therapeutic reason. She entered the hospital for a minor surgery and her uterus was removed. A few years later, she told an audience, in the North Sunflower County Hospital, I would say about six out of the 10 Negro women that go to the hospital are sterilized with the tubes tied. Forced hysterectomies were so common in her state, they were called a Mississippi appendectomy. Hamer recounts confronting the doctor. I went to the doctor who did that to me and asked him, why? Why had he done that to me? He did not have to say nothing, and he didn't. If he was going to give me that sort of operation, then he should have told me. I would have loved to have had children. As to why she did not pursue legal action, she says it would have meant death to get a white lawyer to go after a white doctor in Mississippi. She understood racism robbed her of her fertility and also any avenues to justice. Strangely enough, though, today we see reproductive racism inverted in a way that speaks to the success of Margaret Sanger's Negro Project. Not only contraception, but also abortion have been elevated by many as a human right, a political right, and an important health care benefit, nothing less than the freedom that is being limited or denied to women, specifically black women. It is galling that the pro-abortion movement uses the language of freedom to promote abortion for black women. They advance the idea that her freedom is impeded if she is forced to continue in the pregnancy. They refer to pregnancy as a form of forced labor, slavery, if you will, and emphasize that abortion access enables black women to escape poverty. They use slavery metaphors for pregnancy as if the natural operation of the female reproductive system is akin to the brutal forced labor of slavery. After learning about the brutality of slavery in this course, I hope you see the absurdity of the comparison. It is a deception to divert from the reality of the black child in her mother's womb and an insult to recast the child as if she is in the same power position as the slave master over her mother. They make the child the enemy of the mother's freedom and happiness and paint the black woman as a hapless victim of her own biology. The abortion movement attacks the dignity of the human person. It, like racism, attacks the blessings God has given us when he made us. It attacks a member of the human family, thereby severing the bonds of our common humanity. It attacks the fruits of marriage, procreation, and like racism, conditions us to have a false understanding of the human person, the purpose of sex, marriage, and the family. Because the pro-life movement and the pro-racial justice movement both have the dignity of the human person as an animating principle for their movements, we should be able to see these movements as twin sisters rather than deadly enemies. People are concerned that if we speak up about racism, that somehow that will take away from working on the defense of the life of the child in the womb. To that concern, I say, we can walk and chew gum. Defending the dignity of the human person is not an either or, it is a both and. Over the length of this course, 
We learned about the long history of racism against black people in this country and its devastating effects, not only on the black community, but also on the white community. It is the hard, painful truth that these crimes and injustices, these sins of omission and commission, have set into motion and shaped our society and culture today. And this noxious sin has also seeped into and out from the church from time to time. I mean, are you surprised? We are all fallen due to sin, but praise God, we can be redeemed and called to be light, hope, and love in the darkness and despair of our country and world. The church is the sign and safeguard of human dignity in the world. I implore you, let us take up this call, this mantle, as we have done so with abortion and other threats to human life and dignity. Let us rid ourselves of this sin, this curse of racism. If we are to build a culture of life and a civilization of love, we must work towards racial justice.